Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Plant-Based Palettes. My name is Angela, and I'm the Library Assistant at the Merrimack Public Library. This program is being recorded for later viewing. Please post any questions as they come to you in the chat. They will be answered at the conclusion of this presentation. Presenting our program today is Heidi Tissot, dietitian at the Bedford Hanford. Heidi is a registered dietitian with over six years of experience in the retail setting. She helps shoppers translate the science of nutrition into practical purchases and simple ideas. Heidi also works in the private practice where she emphasizes integrative and functional nutrition using a whole health philosophy. She frequently assists the clients with digestive, autoimmune, hormone, and other health-related challenges, and she loves to work with kids and families as well as adults of all ages. Welcome, Heidi. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for having me and for introducing me. Um, as I know, people are coming in from different places here, um, Bedford being the closest store, but I just want to mention that I do also work in the Londonderry Hannaford store, just in case anyone happens to live geographically closer to that area. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Hannaford Dietitian Program, I am one of the dietitians on a team of about 30 or more of us. Um, in select stores throughout the New England region. So as you mentioned, we help to really uh, focus on the practical aspects of nutrition within the store setting, um, really helping people with ideas, um, meal planning and things like that, food labels, um, and just helping to hopefully simplify their nutrition questions um, as they're shopping in the store as well. So um, we do demonstrations in the stores on a weekly basis, and we are still doing those in um, on a weekly regular basis in um, in both the London Dairy and Bedford store. And then we offer programs to the community and classes as well. So thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this topic. And I, I will share my screen and show you uh, the information on plant based diets tonight. So, all right, I don't think this is on the right. Hold on. It says you are sharing. I'm not at the beginning. Sorry about that. Okay. Angela, you can, yeah, okay. If you just wanna give me a thumbs up. <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay, so as Angela said, um, any questions, please do put those in the chat. Oh my goodness, okay, resume share, sorry. I'm touching too many buttons here. I just wanted to get us into presentation mode. Sorry about this. Okay, view. Oh my goodness, where's my presenter? Such oh, sorry. Uh, from beginning. All right. Okay. So plant-based eating. Uh, this is a big topic. It is a topic that uh, I'm getting a lot of questions on lately. I think it has always been popular, but this term plant-based is fairly new, or it's maybe a newer, um, a newer way of describing the eating pattern. That's obviously focused on more plants than animal products. Um, so I think it's a very timely topic to really get down to the specifics on, um, what this really means and what this looks like in practical life. So a few objectives for this talk are to talk about the different types of plant-based eating, um, the different sort of dietary styles that are that exist, some of the pros and cons of the different types, um, the overall benefits of eating a primarily plant-based diet. And I will also talk about specific nutrients to pay attention to when following a plant-based diet. And then of course, some practical ways to increase plant foods into the diet. Hold on. Um, 
just realized I do not have my computer charger. That is not good. <laughs> Hold on one second. Just go. Should have checked for that. Hold on one second. Sorry. All right, sorry folks, I just don't want to lose you here. <laughs> um, as I should have had this plugged in to begin with. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay. This will not be good. Okay. I'm just going to make sure I'm charging here because I guess I'm on 12%. <laughs> That's not a good thing. Okay. Okay. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay. Um, so plant-based diets are becoming very popular, as I mentioned. And um, this was just a statistic that I found in an article. And of course, now we're not accepting the charge. Sorry about this. Really don't want to lose you guys. Oh my goodness. Okay. Do you mind stopping the recording real quick? I'm sorry, I just. Okay, so are plant-based diets becoming more popular? Um, so many consumers are reassessing their health, um, just taking a closer look at their health and what, what they're eating, of course, but also the impact on the planet. And it's interesting that with plant-based eating, there's certainly both aspects that interest consumers, uh, the environmental aspect of more plant-based food and also the health benefits. So by summer of 2020, plant-based food sales more than doubled 243% with consumers putting 14% more meat and dairy-free options in their baskets. That was a very... Um, poignant statistic to me, 14% is a lot. So as I mentioned, the planet is a key factor with more than a third, 37% of people saying that sus sustainability is a key reason why they chose a plant-based diet. And this was just from an article that you can see at the bottom from New Food Magazine. But um, like I said, I'm getting a lot of questions. I actually recently had, as I mentioned, we do sort of uh, we call them store tours in the grocery, um, in the Bedford and Londonderry store where I work. And what that means is it's basically walking a customer through the aisles to pick out different options or to suggest different products than they may already be choosing. Um, so I recently had a mother reach out to me whose daughter, uh, for the reason that her, her concern is that her daughter teenage daughter is starting a plant-based diet and they wanted to be sure that she was choosing appropriate choices, you know, enough protein and things like that. So it's certainly all ages too, which I find very interesting. Um, so without a strict definition, the, the term plant-based refers to this, it's a category of dietary patterns that share a common focus of a diet based primarily on foods from plants with either no or small amounts of animal products. So pretty easy to understand that. What is plant-based? Hopefully it means you're eating a lot of plants, <laughs> but sometimes we think about more what we're taking away from our diet, meaning 
that an individual doesn't eat meat, for instance. But plants, plant-based, I think, is very positive um, emphasis on what to eat more of versus what to just take away. So hopefully that helps to think about it and sh shift your thinking in that way. So another term is the flexitarian diet. Um, this was from a lecture that I listened to on plant-based eating and also climate friendly and in um, sort of sustainability, a, su a sustainable and healthy diet, I think was the name of the lecture. So they talked about a lot about the environmental impacts as well of eating this way. Um, so defining flexitarian, these were a couple of definitions. So flexible plus vegetarian equals flexitarian. Um, sometimes this is referred to as a semi-vegetarian. So like I said, this has been a, a popular um, way of eating for a long time. There's certainly been vegetarianism, veganism, but we have these newer terms that are coming into the mix here. Um, and flexitarian to me is a very positive thing um, because it's not as rigid as maybe someone who's vegetarian or vegan. Um, so from a nutritional standpoint, the, the reason that's important is because if you're a little more flexible, then you can kind of get the benefits of both, meaning you have the health benefits of eating mostly plants, but then you also may have some, there are some nutritional benefits to eating some animal products, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit more about why that is, why certain nutrients are important that we want to make sure depending on the level of plant-based eating that we're doing, meaning if we're eating a little bit of animal products or we're eating zero, like as in a vegan, then we can just be sure that we're not missing key nutrients. Um, Cause as a dietitian, that's very important to me that when I'm talking to a, a customer and, and hopefully for the individual as well, that, and let's say that they're focused as in the example of this adolescent um, teenage girl I was talking to, she was very focused on the environmental impact, which is wonderful. However, her mother doesn't want her to become iron deficient and nor did she, but just to be aware that let's not cause imbalances in the body or deficiencies, right? That we may be, um, that may be more likely if we're taking out certain types of animal products. Okay. So I digress on that. <laughs> so this is a largely flexitarian just means it's largely plant-based, but maybe including modest amounts of fish, some meat and some dairy foods. Um, and this really encourages variety rather than restriction. So it's not necessarily excluding any specific food, but it may be um, taking, maybe having more meatless or plant protein meals in the overall um, diet. There was a book, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it, uh, written by a dietitian specifically on flexitarian diets. And she actually defined, and I can try to email it to you, Angela, because you might want to know about that as um, working with the library. Um, the author defined flexitarian as in levels actually. So she basically gave options for kind of starting this way of eating so that an individual might be a beginner, um, you know, a moderate or an, an advanced flexitarian. And what she, how she defined that was um, the number of meatless meals per week. So the lower level, I believe was around seven meatless meals in a week. And then the highest um, level of flexitarian was somewhere around 15 or more meatless meals in a given week. So meaning you've made an, a swap for beans or lentils or tofu or some other protein source to put in um, into that meal to substitute for an animal product. So I thought that was interesting that this is kind of a range for folks. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for it, but um, it's nice that there are those options and that you can start from wherever makes 
makes the most sense for you. It's not an all or nothing. And I like to think of nutrition that way. So if you're trying to do this more often, um, that's a great thing to do versus having to be very, very rigid as in following a completely vegan diet is a pretty serious life change for most people. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so other types of plant-based diets, just to define this for the audience here, uh, vegetarian, there are many terms, uh, many subcategories, I should say vegetarian. So a vegetarian typically excludes meat, fish, and poultry. Um, the things, the, the main, um, animal products that are taken out of a vegetarian diet, but they may still include eggs and dairy. And then a pescatarian would be vegetarian pattern that also includes seafood. So nutritionally, um, there's a lot of minerals in seafood that can still be, uh, very important to have some. So I think a pescatarian is another nice option omega-3 fats that are in seafood. So, you know, the occasional seafood meal will allow you to have some of those nutrients in your diet as well. Lacto-ovo vegetarian simply means the individual who defines themselves as vegetarian, but they include dairy products and they also include eggs in their diet. And then of course, most people know a vegan excludes all animal products and even in some cases, even honey. Uh, I already defined flexitarian is a primary focus on a vegetarian diet, but may include small amounts of meat, seafood, eggs, and dairy. And like I said, you can think about the number of meals that are meatless as one way to, um, to kind of set a goal around this, if you'd like. Okay. So moving along here. So to compare and contrast vegetarian and plant-based, I, I mentioned this a, a little bit already, but a vegetarian does not, I shouldn't say they don't always promote health, but vegetarianism doesn't necessarily promote health. Um, and that may be because it is sometimes done a little bit more for moral reasons, meaning more animal welfare concerns or environmental concerns. Um, and just that, and I'm not saying a vegetarian is not healthy um, or not health promoting, but in some cases it isn't because vegetarian diets may not be nutrient rich. Um, it tends to be a focus a little bit more on what is being taken out of the diet. Whereas plant-based obviously means we're having more plants and is a greater focus on nutrient rich foods um, and plants as some of the most nutritious foods that we can eat, right? So this is considered to be a whole eating style um, versus just what you're taking out. So, and, and a plant-based diet is also the belief that a small amount of meat does not necessarily harm one's health. So some of the nutritional advantages of a flexitarian diet here um, include that, you know, plant-based diet with moderate amount, moderate amount of dairy products, low amounts of meat and sugar generally provide a mix of high quality protein, definitely fiber because fiber is only found in plant foods, right? So just to make that distinction that animal products will never have fiber in them because it's only found in fruits, vegetables, beans, um, nut seeds, plant, plant foods. Um, a, a flexitarian diet will have a large number of vitamins, minerals, and also un, um, unsaturated fats or healthy fats. So dairy foods can be an uh, important source of protein, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, iodine, vitamin A, vitamin D, B12, and so on. <laughs> So uh, this is just to show that if you're following this flexitarian approach, you would also be uh, getting some of those nutrients from the dairy component, though there are a lot of non-dairy choices now where most of the time, some of those products would be fortified with a number of those nutrients because almond milk doesn't naturally have vitamin D or calcium typically in it. 
So it's fortified with those things. Definitely want to make sure that if you're substituting a non-dairy product for a dairy product that you have the, um, that it has adequate calcium and vitamin D in particular, um, as it's sometimes added in smaller amounts at, so when you compare the two, the dairy milk and the non-dairy milk, um, it, it, they're not always equivalent in the nutrient value. So it may have less calcium is what I mean to say. So just always kind of check those side by side. So soybeans are a great source of total protein. Um, the quality of the soy protein is higher than that of other plant proteins. So, um, and similar to animal proteins. So there are a lot of great soy healthy soy products. Edamame is one, and you can put that in so many different recipes, put it on a salad, eat it, just eat it plain, um, or have a good um, soy milk type product as well. So within the milk alternative category, soy milk has actually the highest protein content and is the same amount of protein as a cow's milk would have. So just know that versus if you're doing a coconut milk, a rice milk, or an almond milk, that kind of thing. So important nutrients to just to be conscious of um, when following a plant-based diet would be the calcium as if you're, if you're taking out that regular, um, that cow's dairy product, you want to be sure that you're getting calcium from other sources, as I mentioned, leafy greens, and making sure that the fortified milks that you're choosing are equivalent in the calcium content. Tofu would also be a source of, um, of calcium as well. So iron, want to be aware of the iron content of your diet. And this is because iron is in higher amounts in meat products and animal animal foods for sure. There is iron that exists in um, some of these things here, flax, chia, oats, whole grains, and greens. It's just not typically absorbed as well. So just to mention that, even if it is a good source of iron, it doesn't always absorb the plant form of iron, doesn't absorb quite as well. So a good thing to do is pair these foods with vitamin C to boost the absorption of it. Um, B12 is an important vitamin, which helps with neurological function. Um, it gives you energy. It helps with blood cell formation. So we definitely need B12. It's, it tends to be checked sometimes when someone has fatigue or, um, if they're, if a doctor is looking for different types of anemias and B12 can be, be a, a certain type of anemia that can develop. And with age, we absorb less B12. And the reason I'm mentioning B12 with plant-based diets is because B12 is typically only found in animal foods, okay? So if you're following a vegan diet, it's gonna be a lot more challenging to get that B12 in your diet, right? Because you're not having any of those animal foods versus if you're having some of those other types of plant-based diets that I mentioned, like the lacto-ovo vegetarian or a flexitarian, more of a flexitarian approach, right? Where you're still having some eggs, some dairy. Um, now, certainly B12 can be fortified in certain things like uh, cereals, plant-based milks. But if, especially if someone is a, a, a strict vegan, they may require needing a B12 supplement um, and definitely trying to get some of those fortified foods as well. So just want to be sure of that. And then protein, you know, sometimes I think it's a misconception that someone on a plant-based diet, um, or vegetarian diet is low in protein. There are a lot of plant-based protein sources. So you can see tofu, tempeh, beans, nuts, seeds, soy products, and also plant-based protein powders are huge. Now there's a lot of protein powders out there that are also, um, a concentrated source of protein. We have, um, nature's promise, which is the Hannaford store brand has a very good new protein powder, 
Um, there's other brands, there's lots of them. So if it's, if it's low in sugar and high in protein, that's a good thing. Um, and certainly check to make sure it doesn't have other fillers, but I am, I'm not opposed to a, a good protein powder. If you're following a plant-based diet and you just need to make sure that you're getting adequate protein, this is a good way to do it because it's very concentrated. You can make a nice smoothie. Um, you could add it, had like half a scoop to oatmeal, um, and things like that. Okay, so just to show some practical food guides for um, you know healthy eating that could fall kind of more in the flexitarian um, way of eating uh, and and just general general healthy eating here. So the Mediterranean diet can certainly be more of a plant based or more of a flexitarian approach. It, we have, as you can see on the right, this is the Mediterranean diet pyramid which shows a lot of plants. It shows a heavy emphasis on fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, which are the beans, lentils, nuts and seeds, that sort of thing. And then um, you can see an emphasis on more seafood. If you look up oh, uh, to the next kind of box there, some poultry, eggs and dairy and yogurt is definitely a great um, healthy source of protein and other nutrients. And then meat is at the very top of the, of the pyramid. So smaller amount of red meat, right. And, and, um, just meats overall. Um, this healthy eating plate is from the Harvard medical school. I just wanted to show that as there's a lot of different versions of the healthy plate, but I like this one because there's a greater emphasis on vegetables over fruits, um, just kind of a bigger section of the plate. And we definitely want to incorporate as many vegetables as possible. And then also healthy fats in there. So we can see the healthy fats are going to be incorporated in our meals and our cooking in things like avocados, nuts, and seeds. So if you look, if you kind of compare and contrast on the right, you can see all of those, um, olive oil, avocados, nuts, and seeds in that um, largest section of the pyramid. So the Mediterranean diet is one that really would be considered a flexitarian type of a diet. And it's one that there's so much research on the health benefits of following this eating style is just tremendous for heart health, for inflammation, for cognitive function, longevity. I mean, it's, it's, um, just a lot of research around this way of eating. Um, and, you know, I, I spent some time in Italy when I was in college and certainly they can eat a lot of pasta and bread. So it isn't, it doesn't always necessarily look like this, but I think the emphasis on those good, healthy fats, a lot of plants and some seafood and less of the meats um, and dairy at, at the, the top of the pyramid is really how I think of the Mediterranean diet. Old Ways is a good website that is focused around Mediterranean eating. So that is a good resource to check out for that as well. So let's talk about how do we add some more vegetables to our meals? Um, this, these were just a few quick ideas. I'd love to hear if anyone else has other suggestions, if you wanna put them in the chat. Um, but if you haven't already, like. And we're, you know, we're still in summer, thank goodness, but there's so many ways to cook vegetables. So you can roast them. I have a lot of good recipes for that. And, you know, think beyond just steaming vegetables. I think bringing out the flavor, add that healthy olive oil, that good fat to the vegetables um, is just an amazing way to cook them. You can certainly have them in a salad. You can certainly eat them raw. You can steam them. But if you add that good, healthy fat, like from an olive oil or another healthy oil, you'll also increase the absorption of certain nutrients. So just something to remember there. Other creative ways to add more vegetables to your meals would be pureeing some um, carrots or sweet potato to maybe thicken a soup. That would be one strategy as we go more into soup season. Um, we can certainly do a stir fry. We can pair raw vegetables with your favorite hummus. So, you know, I, I like to mix it up. Think about 
how you can have some raw and some, you know, salads and things like that. Cause that's a different mouthfeel, more crunchy. And especially this to me, you're very refreshing versus, um, ways to have them cooked as well. Cause you're going to really bring out different flavors by cooking them. Um, and certainly putting them in a soup or something like that. I think when I hear from folks that they have picky eaters that don't like vegetables as much, um, what a sin, right. But, and especially with children, sometimes I think that it's because maybe that the, uh, family or the household has not varied the ways they're cooking them. So it's good if, if you have a child in your life like that, certainly ask and try to get them to think about which ones they would prefer crunchy or raw, like a carrot. Some kids really like to eat them raw and some adults too, versus other ones they might like cooked. And it may be different from one vegetable to another. So you really bring out different flavors when you cook them or roast them versus eating them raw. So it's not like it's, it's only good to have them one way is the point there. Um, and then you can also do things like different salad combinations, like a broccoli slaw instead of just a green salad. Um, we can use romaine lettuce as a, a wrap instead of bread. So that's a good thing to do. Um, also to cut out a little bit of the carbohydrate from too much bread and get more vegetables in your life by using um, what we would call a lettuce wrap. Um, so where does fruit fit in? So, and, and just to talk about servings for a second, we need about three cups total of vegetables in a day. I don't think I mentioned that on the previous slide and about two cups of fruit. So about five cups in a day or more. So I would say most adults need about three servings of fruit and a serving is about a four ounce, very small apple or small fruit that you would hold in your hand or a half a cup of cut up fruit. So obviously for snacks, it's easy to grab a piece of fruit. It's easy to add some fruit to an oatmeal or even put some fruit in a salad, like this time of year, blueberries, strawberries, you could add apples, pears. So mix it up. Don't always have to eat them the same way. And I'm a big fan of frozen fruit and all the different blends of frozen fruit that we have at Hannaford is tremendous. There's so many different kinds. So it doesn't have to just be blueberries, strawberries, bananas. It could be kiwi, peaches, mango, you know, so adding frozen fruit to a smoothie is a really easy way to get some more fruit into your breakfast or into a snack. Um, you could just also have frozen fruit on hand and pour a little bit into a bowl to have as a snack or after even like a little dessert. Sometimes I, it's refreshing. So sometimes we like there's just the sweetness of fruit. So why legumes? When we talk about plants, we have our fruits, our vegetables, legumes are the beans, um, lentils, and um, peas that are high in protein. So why legumes? Nutritionally, they're high in protein, high in fiber, magnesium, potassium, zinc, and folate, just to name a few of the nutrients. So you can do canned beans, obviously very convenient and ready to use. They can be added to a salad or soup very easily. Um, do check the, the amount of sodium in the canned beans. And then if you want to opt for, you can certainly do a dried legume if you want to, it, it, they just take a little more cooking time, right? So I'd love to hear in the chat if anybody is a fan of using dried beans more or if they have any tips for that. A lot of people now too are using things like an instant pot or a a pressure cooker to cook things faster. There's a lot of ways you could do a dried bean that way, but I do find canned are very convenient, affordable, ready to use. And when you rinse canned beans, you cut the sodium like significantly in the product just by rinsing them almost in half. So if you're already choosing a low sodium canned bean, that's a good place to start, but you can also rinse them and knock the sodium down a lot. <laughs> so they have tremendous um, nutrient benefits. Okay. 
So I wanted to show you guys um, a plant-based shopping list to really talk more about a few products. So I'm going to, hold on, switch my screen here to pull that up. Okay, so I need to share again. Where's my share button? Oh my goodness. I can't find it really. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, share screen. Okay, actually, before I do that, um, okay, nope, it's not that. I guess I don't have it here. I lost it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to go right to Hannaford.com so you can see the shopping list because it's already curate, curated. Um, okay. So hopefully you guys can see Hannaford healthy living tab here. Angela, if you could confirm, yeah, looks like you're seeing that. Okay, good. So this is a great place to go anyways, just to see all of the dietitians are listed here. So I did wanna show you this tab anyhow. Um, and you can see all the online nutrition education that we're doing, the classes that we're offering. We do have a whole list of online classes that we do on a rotating basis. Um, some of our dietitians here. I have did a short video, just different new popular nutrition topics that you can find there. Um, so definitely a, a place to check out and all the contact information, our email addresses are listed um, as well. But I wanted to show you the um, plant-based eating here. So if I go down to shop our collections, so oh no, where is that? Okay, no, it's not there. Maybe they've moved it. Plant-based, because we have so many new products that there was an entire plant-based list I had found. Okay. Yeah, so there's an entire uh, plant-based shopping list here of different products that you can find that will be dairy free um you know alternatives to meats and things like that so we have this new plant-based burger that is a nature's promise product which is our store brand um so i just wanted to kind of highlight a few items here um, so always look at the protein source that they're using in the product. So this is a soy based product. So it's going to be very high in protein. It also has some millet, flaxseed, coconut, um, different spices. So it's, you know, 11 grams of fat, but not, but low in the saturated fat because it's not a meat product, right? So meat is red meat tends to be high in saturated fat. So that's a definite benefit to having more plant-based protein is you'd be lowering that saturated fat. I just, I do want to point out though, the sodium in this is 560 milligrams. So what can happen with some of these um, plant-based alternatives is the sodium content is very high. So just be aware of that and always look there on the nutrition label. Um, it's not that it isn't still a good alternative, but you know, we have 21 grams of protein, but somehow to flavor it. And I don't know, they felt they needed to add that much <laughs> sodium to it is the downside, right? You can see very high, it does have iron and potassium. So, and plenty of protein. So 21 grams would be almost equivalent to what you would get in a source of, of regular meat. But I always look at like, we have these different products that are um, meat imitation meat type products, um, plant-based ground beef. So depending on what 
is it's made of, um, let's see here, meatless burger patties. Let me just see if there's any other ones I wanted to show you. Um, let's see. This one here. Okay, so this is a newer product. It is 17 grams of total fat, five grams of saturated fat. So, um, and all unfortunately high in sodium too. So 21 grams of protein as well. Um, doesn't tell me the nutritional fat, the um, ingredients that is bizarre. Okay, I don't see that. <laughs> um, or the impossible burger, we can check that one out. There's so many, a lot of these are newer products as well. Um, so I, another soy protein. So, um, I do like some of the products that are more bean based, like as in black bean burgers or lentils, things like that. Uh, sometimes it's not quite as high in protein though. So when you look here, this 19 or 20 grams of protein, that is pretty high for a plant-based alternative. And um, that's probably why they're using a soy or maybe a pea protein as well as sometimes used as an alternative. So just check out what is the protein source that you're actually consuming? What are the other ingredients in there? You know, does it have a lot of preservatives and additives or is it more something like, you know, things that you can pronounce, right? And, um, and you can see, as I was talking earlier, um, about fortification, right? So I don't know if everyone can see that this has been fortified with B vitamins, B12, B6, um, zinc, and that is to make sure that it's high enough in some of those nutrients to um, sort of be a, an alternative to a meat product. So um, it just, I think it's good to not just pick it up and assume that it's healthy because it's plant-based, but actually really know like what, what is this made of, right? Um, you obviously know if you're eating lentils or black beans, you know what that, or edamame, that's a whole food item. So I'm, I try to encourage more of that than just some of these alternatives. Um, but, you know, definitely they can, they can have a place and particularly if they're healthy or lower in sodium and that kind of thing. So we have a lot of products like this in the uh, protein category in the protein powders and protein drinks. And this can be good for something like a smoothie. So this is uh, a plant-based protein shake. And let's check in this category. And this is something, so as I'm showing you guys different products, this is essentially what I would also be doing in the store is comparing different items and making recommendations so that it's tangible um, for you. So just to key in on certain things you want to look for nutritionally would be the, in the protein category, protein powders or protein drinks would be this added sugar. You want to be sure that it's not high in added sugars. So we have six grams of added sugar in this particular product. And the protein source here is not soy. It is a pea protein. Okay. So it's a very isolate, um, concentrated source of the pea protein. So that would be a good option for on the go or um, a breakfast, something like that. You can also buy a good protein powder that, um, like I said, could be great in a smoothie maybe, or um, you know, adding a little bit to even a recipe. So there's a lot of different things here. Um, some dairy-free cheese, and there's a lot of dairy-free options. Um, let's see if I can find protein powder, or if there are any particular products that you want suggestions for, please do put that. I think there's a few things in the chat. <laughs> so here you can see Vega is a, a protein powder that we carry that's, that is good quality, high in, um, protein, but not too high in sugar. Yeah. So there's a lot, and this is just even a, a quick sampling of them, but, um, definitely be aware of 
added sodium, added sugar. When it, you're seeing plant-based, you know, I always like to educate folks on reading the nutrition label. Don't just pick it up and look at the front of the package because it looks healthy. It may or may not be healthy um, based on the nutritionals, right? So the other thing that we do at Hannaford, and I don't see a guiding star on this, is we have the guiding stars program. So you can see if it earns, um, if it's healthy enough to earn a guiding star or one, two or three stars, which means that it's gonna be a higher nutritional value. I don't see guiding stars on this product either. So that's not, not great. <laughs> I wanna see those guiding stars um, as that tells me that it is lower in sodium, lower in sugar and that kind of thing. Let's see if I can find one that earns a guiding star here. That is not good. <laughs> um, this is another protein product. That's a plant-based product here. Yeah, okay, here we are. So here's the guiding star at the bottom. I don't know if you guys can see that little blue running man as I like to call him. Um, so we have that system in the store. So if you're comparing two products side by side, you can see if it earns zero, one, two, or three guiding stars, the more the better. This at least earns one. And um, let's see, 16 grams of plant protein. So it is a protein blend of pea protein and chia seeds. And this has nine grams of added sugar. Unfortunately, that's a little bit higher than I'd like to see. Um, 10 probably on the, the highest end of a protein powder um, and 16 grams of total protein. But um, the, the Guiding Stars is based off of the nutrition facts. There's nothing else. Um, it's literally an analysis of the whole nutrition label. So it's not you know, determine based on whether it's organic or any other kind of criteria. It's purely based on the nutritional facts of that food. So that when you're comparing things and you see those stars, you know that um, you do, you don't have to do quite as much legwork and looking at all of this information potentially, though it's still good to know how to, how to read the nutrition facts. Um, the Guiding Stars is based off of the the nutrition facts panel. So just wanted to mention that. Okay, so I think um, that comes to the end of most of my slides here. Um, I do think there's a couple comments in the chat. I haven't seen it yet, but I see it um, lighting up. So maybe we wanna take a few questions. Absolutely. There's a lot, well, there were a few things that came up as you asked questions. Um, oh, I see here. Okay. Let's see. Okay. I think I was recommended the dietitian I worked with in Nashua. I love the concept of flexitarian and introduction to more plant-based diet soft start. Yes. Um, how does one get iodine in their diet if they don't like sea vegetables? Um, that is a good question. So, most likely if you're vegan, um, you'd probably pr want to be on a, a, some supplementation, meaning a, a good multivitamin. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that. Like you would probably want to talk to your doctor or just get, um, a recommendation for a good vitamin that kind of covers your bases there. But, um, I just have to keep this information a little bit just general, right? As far as um, when it comes to you specifically and your nutrition, if you are vegan, and like I said, there's those specific nutrients kind of of concern, that would be a case where I, I'd want you to probably talk to your doctor and just be sure that um, you probably wouldn't get your, your blood checked for blood work for iodine levels, but you could ask about B12, you could ask about iron, you could ask about vitamin D even, so in that case, I would, um, I would talk to your providers about that and see, 
just to be sure that you aren't um, deficient and also just so you have kind of a baseline of your own body. And then you can kind of see if, if in fact you need a little bit of extra supplementation of things like B12 or anything else like that. But in a good a good multivitamin would have some iodine. So that would be probably something to consider. Protein is not always complete, but has to be taken with a complementary ingredient. It's just more of a comment. Um, there is some, I guess, controversy around that, that it used to be a focus on um, combining certain protein foods. Um, so I'm not certain that's, that's always necessary, but I do think having just a variety in, of different protein sources, you'll get different types of amino acids, which are in different proteins. And that's what the complementary protein concept is about. So I think it just don't get too focused on um, that, that level of analysis necessarily, but just try to have a variety of different protein sources in your diet, like different beans, lentils, edamame, legumes, things like that. And I think this was you, Angela said, when I cooked with meat, I would put sauteed vegetables in my meatloaf. Yeah. Or any of those plant-based meat products. Um, sorry, I just realized I can stop the share here so that I can you don't have to look at the screen, but um, anything else? I was just seeing if there was any um, specific questions here. Casseroles such as lentil shepherd pie are great for picky eaters. Thank you. Brianna said that. Curry is a great dish for including vegetables. Yes. So vegetables do not have to be boring. Certainly different seasonings and spices and curry is a fantastic way to do, or sauces, right? Um, if you do, I wonder if you make your own curry, Brianna, or not. Um, <laughs> I, I do. I do do uh, different kind of you? curries. Yeah. And then uh, a thought that popped up, one thing that we've been doing is spaghetti. I mean, that's an easy thing for people to throw in like some mushrooms or something in there to bump mm -hmm. up the vegetables. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. You can throw in tons of veggies and um, particularly to, yeah, something like a meatloaf, or even if you're using a plant-based um, alternative there, you could do like tiny, you know, cut up mushrooms, shredded, shredded carrots. That's a great way. Shredded zucchini. There's a lot of ways you can do like really fine, um, you know, forms of the vegetables to add moisture as well. Certainly in a soup or in a pasta, that's easy. In a lasagna, you can sneak some of those veggies in there. Mm -hmm. I hate to say sneak um, as if it's a bad thing, but sometimes we need to just add a few more in, right? I tried to convince my kids that it was like the cakes, like a funfetti cake meatloaf with like, I would put in carrots and red pepper and yellow pepper and a few other things. So it looked like there were little sprinkles inside the meatloaf. It's, it's just for fun. Think, did they go for it? <laughs> sometimes it works a lot of times it doesn't but yeah yeah does anyone here have picky um or children i i hate to actually use that word i i try not to say picky eaters because i think it's a label to that sometimes kids feel kind of like you know it's a label it's like singling them out um whether it's true to an extent but um but i do find that you know, we may just say that they, there's certain things they like more than others, or it's really important the way we talk about food with kids as well, that we don't kind of, um, instill that more because that identity sometimes, and I've seen this play out even at Hannaford when we've done recipe demos. And I may in the past, when I was, we were doing sampling in the store, we hope to get back to that, but we actually made recipes and gave out the samples and I would have parents come up and say, oh, my kid would never eat that. And the child's sitting, standing right there or say something like, you know, oh, you wouldn't like that, you know? <laughs> so it's just interesting how we talk about these things versus being encouraging of, hey, you know, do you want to try that? I do think it's always should be their choice. And that's true of adults too. There are, there are adults that would classify themselves as more picky eaters and, you know, 
it's, it has to be an individual's choice to try something. They don't need to be pressured into it. Right. So sometimes that's what happens, especially with kids. And it's just exposing them to different ways. Like I said, if you never roast vegetables and you always do canned or steamed, they're not going to taste as good. So try roasting them or try putting them in a different way, you know, and the same for adults. Sometimes we're just bored of the same thing, right? <laughs> we're not excited about it, right? So, yeah. Does anyone sure. else have any other questions that um, about plant-based diets or um, anything that I covered? So much good information. Absolutely. To be able to remind yourself that it, if the idea of a flexitarian is very, very appealing to me only because mm -hmm. it's a soft start. It isn't a hard and true thing. You're just making a transition for whatever reason works for you and allowing the idea of more plants into your life, more plants into your shopping cart and mm -hmm. keeping in mind all of the things that, that the body needs in order to maintain healthy um all the stamina that you need and uh to check in with your doctor just to be oh sure yeah it, you're getting and i yeah and i think that came up in one of the chat questions but do you talk to your doctor about this if you are even if you're following you know plant-based more but if, if you're making any serious change where maybe you're completely taking meat out right red meat let's say um, and just to be sure that everything's kind of still balanced, because if you've been eating that food for a long time, and then you just never eat it again. And you're not very intentional about whether you need a supplement or just which food sources of those things. And that's where a dietitian can really help with that. If you do have really more specific questions, um, more targeted, like I need sources of this, right. Um, I was told I'm deficient in this, you know, so we can help with those kinds of um, queer, uh, inquiries as well. But I do think sometimes people don't bring this up with their doctor. They don't think to do that. And um, I recently was talking to somebody who that was the conversation. I said, well, did you talk to your doctor about this? And she said, no, I, do I need to? And I, <laughs> and this is a more of a, a, a younger adult, but you know, maybe like thirties age. And I said, well, you know, you don't want to like be iron deficient and then want to have children. And, you know, nobody wants that, but it's just to think about your health, um, overall. And just, if you're take, if you're really removing a number of foods, how are we doing that intentionally? Right. So that it just kind of, kind of evens out, balances out, um, and that we have vitality as well. Yes. I'm always craving protein, but I'm not a good meat eater. So I'm glad I found more protein options. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And sometimes too, when you said soft start, the flexitarian approach may just be like cutting back the meat, even in a, in a meal, it could be half the amount of meat and more lentils or more beans. You know what I mean? So it's a smaller serving. And from the environmental side too, I didn't talk as much about that, but you know, red meat does have a, the highest kind of impact on natural resources, greenhouse gases, water use. So sometimes it's like, I just want to eat and it's more costly. A lot of times the cost of meat has unfortunately gone up a bit. So, um, sometimes it's from that standpoint too, we just want to, maybe we want to stretch the amount of meat we're eating and have like one pound of meat in a, in a soup or in a meal, one pot meal and add lentils and add other plant sources to it. Right. So that we can kind of, um, have the nutritional benefits, have the, have all of it, you know, the budget, you know, all of those reasons that we would do that. So I think that can be done too. Yeah. Whole foods. And it is, it doesn't need to be, you draw, like you, you watch one terrifying documentary about <laughs> yeah. whatever and you're like, I'm never, ever going to consume meat of any kind ever again, or I'm never yeah. going to consume it, that it can be a shock to your system. So checking in with your doctor and then flexing into your goal yeah, um, would definitely be a healthier um, aspect. I like the idea of really paying attention to your food, to the food labels, um, especially if you cannot pronounce it, do you really want to consume yeah, it? The, yeah. the idea of a whole food, if you can imagine what it was on the earth, then it probably is something 
with a better value for what you're putting into your body. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. There are plenty of recipes out there that they're like, you can do this with four ingredients. And you're like, will it taste good? Yeah, um, yeah for sure. And those plant-based um, products sometimes like, and this is true with other things too. People see gluten-free and they assume, oh, it's gluten-free. It must be good. You know, I mean, most of us have the common sense to know, well, I do need to read, read what's in it. It kind of like think a little more critically about what am I actually eating? Don't just look at the front advertising um, information on the front of the package. And that's why we also do the guiding stars to compare products more easily. But, um, you know, don't just grab plant-based when you see, cause that's, it's a buzzword right now. So I just want to say from a marketing side, I'm seeing it all over the store. You know, maybe you are too, like it, all these companies are like plant-based, plant-based, even it's kind of silly sometimes. Cause you're like, well, you know, beans are always been plant-based. So why are we calling, <laughs> calling it out? Um, but in particular, if it's a product that's been formulated to be plant-based, like those imitation meats and things, do read what's in it. And like I said, unfortunately, some of them are very high sodium. So I know I just pulled up a couple, but um, try and see if you can find like your best option in that category, if you're going to do that um, or don't have it all the time, you know, just like anything, um, just kind of be aware of that. So it's a great point. Eating the rainbow. It's the hardest thing, except for during this season to be able yeah, to. Yeah, this is a great time to do this. All right. Well, thank you for having me, Angela. And thank you for your patience as a, a little technical difficulty in the beginning, but I appreciate you guys sticking around and your engagement and your questions. For sure. Uh, I wanted to thank you very, very much, Heidi, for joining us tonight. It was so thorough. I'm inspired to buy more things and paying more, better attention to my ingredients. Um, this program was recorded and everyone registered will receive a link to the Merrimack Public Library YouTube channel to view at your leisure. I've also placed a link for feedback about this program in the chat. Please let me know how the program went and if there's any other topics that you'd like the library to cover. Uh, it looks like our chat is all answered and I wanted to thank you again, Heidi, and everyone who joined us today. I hope you all have a fabulous evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. You too.